My name is Paul Grandal. I'm the director of the New York State Writers Institute. This summer, the University Art Museum, Performing Arts Center, and New York State Writers Institute, the three arts presenters at UAlbany, discuss the idea of a collaboration to address the pandemic, racial reckoning, and cultural uncertainty. How could we plan relevant programming that focuses on substantive ways and with lasting impact? How could we connect with our students and communities? While discussing these questions, we all felt certain that whatever we came up with, it would in some way include artists. Artists that we have worked with and presented at UAlbany. Artists we admired. Artists we knew were deeply invested in making sense of our world and this fraught moment. We arrived at this series, Artist to Artist, Addressing This Moment. We have invited nine artists, three each from visual, performing, and literary arts disciplines to participate in these pre-recorded conversations over the course of the fall 2020 semester. Our goal is to offer collaborative programming that provides continued opportunities for student and public engagement in an online format. We hope these conversations will help shine a guiding light on difficult issues, share perspectives that could help lead to tangible solutions, and demonstrate the need for respect, empathy, inclusivity, and humanity. These things are at the core of creative works of art and are needed more than ever in today's society. Our first guest is 2013 University at Albany graduate, Nana Kwame Ajebrenya. He's the author of the New York Times best-selling short story collection, Friday Black, a satirical look at what it's like to be young and black in America. Friday Black won the Penn Gene Stein Book Award and best-selling author Roxane, Roxane Gay called it, quote, dark and captivating and essential, a call to arms and a condemnation. Nana previously visited UAlbany in October, 2018 as part of the Writers Institute's Visiting Writers series. My name is Kim Engel, and I am the Associate Director of the UAlbany Performing Arts Center. I'm delighted to introduce you to dance artist and choreographer Jade Solomon Curtis. Jade's work integrates classical and African-American vernacular movements with mixed media and hip hop culture. She collaborates with innovative artists to create socially relevant multidiscipline work. Her signature piece, Black Like Me, had three performances at UAlbany in October of 2019 as part of the university-wide 400 Years of Inequality Observance. My name is Corinna Rip Shamming, and I'm the director and chief curator at the University Art Museum. We are pleased to introduce you to Ashley Teamer, a New Orleans-based multimedia artist. Her dynamic wall works employ painting and collage materials, such as WNBA trading cards and a variety of sports imagery to explore Black femininity, athleticism, and community. Ashley exhibited at the University Art Museum in 2019 as part of the show ACE, Art on Sports, Promise, and Selfhood. No, this is super dope. I don't think I've ever been invited to be a part of a conversation with, with artists in this capacity where we are leading the conversation, not having people really direct us and tell us what to do. But to get started, my name is Jade Solomon Curtis. Uh, I am a dancer, choreographer, curator, and founder of uh, a nonprofit called Solo Magic, which is an arts initiative that collaborates with innovative artists to make socially relevant work. Our tagline is activism is the muse or I am the muse. Um, I probably I'm connected with you all because we've all performed or done some type of work in one way or another with the University of Albany. Um, I recently performed there in, whoa, was that October or November? I really can't remember. Sorry, time is like all over the place right now. Um, but I performed a piece called Black Like Me, an exploration of the word nigger. And that was um, um, a pretty interesting experience, but I'm sure that we can at some point in time get into that. But um, I can pass this off to Ashley Teamer. Am I saying that right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Hey y'all. Um, yeah, I was like, all right, meeting some, you know, some strangers, but maybe they will become friends by the end of this conversation today. And just excited to be connected with other artists. Like I'm totally here for that. Um, so yeah, my name is Ashley Teamer. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I Yes, New Orleans. I make um, <laughs> I'm a visual artist. I make paintings and collages, video. Um, I also do performance as a drag king sometimes. Um, I was connected with Albany because I was in a show called Ace Art, Sports and Culture, I wanna say. Um, I was doing, I have a series of works that are about the WNBA and um, my grandmother uh, was a basketball coach and started a basketball team at Dillard University. So um, I, uh, the series that was highlighted in that show was about kind of like um, tying those two histories together in flattening time to see all the different people that uh, influence history and make things move forward. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm actually coming to y'all live from my studio because um, I'm currently in school getting MFA in painting at Yale. Awesome. Um, those are great introductions. Jennifer said, <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll get to introduce your brother and yourself. And that was great. I'm like, I'm not, I don't know what to say after that. My name is um, Nana Kwame J. Bernardo. I'm an author. Uh, my first book was called Friday Black. Um, I, when I was on book tour, I did go to visit Albany as part of the tour, but that was more because I actually was a SUNY Albany student. Um, I graduated mm. in um, 2013. So uh, that's sort of my connection to UA. And so I know that um, program pretty well. But yeah, uh, I write, my first book is a collection of short stories and my, a lot of my fiction it deals with sort of a wide gamut of stuff, but um, I'm interested in the system to kind of try to get us to forget about hum our humanity and whether that be racism, capitalism, hyper consumerism, or I guess like a sort of a myriad of others. A lot of the stories deal with that through a sometimes sort of surreal lens, but often it's just, you know, sort of retellings or reimaginations of things that have happened in my life. But I'm also uh, just now starting to like dip my toe into um, photography. I just dropped off for like five rolls of film today at the lab. And she was like, come pick them up on Wednesday. And I remember feeling this fear about, oh my God, by Wednesday, this world will be like totally different. <laughs> and uh, so yes. I'm starting to try to get that. <laughs> yeah, I felt like this anxiety. <laughs> like, sure, like that, just how casually she had, she said that. Um, but yeah, I'm starting to dip my toe into that. So I'm really into uh, sort of to hear some of that stuff that you are into, Ashley, on the visual side. And uh, I make beats in the way that people who like don't really do music make beats, but like if you come to like, you know, if you give me the ox cord, I'll be the annoying person who <laughs> plays something I made <laughs> opt in. So yeah, my name is Nana. Well, nice to meet all of you. I think this is such a, um, I don't know, just right now I was talking about um, with a couple of people, a couple of colleagues that I've had thus far today about just the level of anxiety <laughs> right now like it's just super tense and, and you're located in Ashley you're in New Orleans and where are you Nana I'm in the Bronx in the Bronx I'm actually right. in New Haven right now oh Different. in New Haven oh right he did say Yale Connecticut okay okay um but yeah so just I was I know initially when we were introduced I was like where is everybody where where are you from Nana uh Kwame that's Ghanaian, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just like a little overwhelmed. I'm honestly just a little anxious with everything that's going on. I'm curious to know how you all Black people are doing in your respective locations. How are y'all handling? I know that's probably not one of the questions, but how are how are you all, you know, taking care of yourselves? And do you feel like you are? Everyone scratches their chin. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I like recently have gotten deep into bird watching. Like, hmm. like that's been one source of like inspiration for me. I mean, I, I, it's been, I think like with all, everything that's going on, like I also like left my home <laughs> and everything that yeah. I know wow. to be in this program right now. So I, 
I feel just like kind of adrift in many ways, but I've just been like going bird watching and like checking out cool birds and observing nature. Like that's been like the one consistent thing that I've done that I feel like has allowed me to like, just like, like step over, just like go into another zone for a moment of calm and then just yeah. need to go back into it. It's, um, I think it's a super important question that you can't miss how artists are like, anyone is taking care of themselves right now. Um, I mentioned the photography thing and in some ways that is a part of it, like a new craft. I really like the idea of being like a novice in something, having it not be tied to like my livelihood as writing sort of is. And so there's some a certain kind of freedom in that space. And so I think photography has been something for me that has just helped me sort of feel like uh, work that creative muscle, but it's not as, it's, it's not that kind of certain kind of stress that has become sometimes attached to writing for me. Uh, and uh, when it, I did, I was like sort of doing the running thing for a while. I think a lot of people like running was like the sourdough of like quarantine of like just the outside version for a lot of people. And I was part of that like squad for a little bit. And I still am a little bit, now it's getting cold, so that might be a dub probably. And then um, uh, I've tried to make an effort to sort of like connect in ways with friends, whether it's through, through video games or whatever. I, I've been sort of just finding ways, things I could do communally, even if it can't be in person. And video games have been one of those things. But um, the answer for me, like if I'm taking care of myself, like I try my best. Oftentimes I'm like, you know, in spiral mode, but I think that's sort of inevitable. How about you? Um, well, I'm located here in Seattle, where the population of specifically Black and or African American, however people identify, is like 6%. So there's not very many people um, where I walk outside my door and see people that look like me. So that is also, that's kind of like this, um, this thing that I'm constantly grappling with. Um, I also, <laughs> in the beginning of quarantine, which was almost a year ago, um was a runner as well started started running and then there was just a uh, sense of just a, a lack of safety not necessarily feeling safe um running and hearing about all these different things happening um random acts of violence happening around the country and so that mm -hmm. ended been in the house um since then working out with some weights and things like that um my sanity is directly connected to me having the freedom to physically do something with my body. I'm a dancer and choreography so, choreographer. So, and I don't want to say that that's an obvious thing because um, it may not be for a lot of people, but it is something that is um, that I'm inherently connected to, and and it is something that really ensures that I can mentally and um, physically and spiritually be present. Um, so additionally, I also run a, um, I'm a chief operations officer for our, our parent nonprofit, which is called Pan-African Center for Empowerment. Um, we have several initiatives and that is all connected. I work with black people across the board. And so I get to cut on my screen every day mm -hmm. and look at beautiful black people. And that is just, has really fed my sanity too. Um, and also learning a lot with how we all are coping um, yeah. and realizing that, that um, you know, starting the day with how are you doing and really meaning that and asking that question is really important for all of our survival um, and also important for us to thrive. Um, so yeah, I think, um, yo, uh, Real though, it's highs and lows. <laughs> yo -yo. It's the only possibility. 100%. It's a straight up yo-yo. So I feel like I'm constantly trying to figure out like like that that balance thing is real. It's super real. Um, and um, keeping in mind that we're in a pandemic, and some of us uh, some of us in our community can't eat and don't have shelter and don't have clothes. And so you know, here I am trying to figure out how I can make another damn dance, <laughs> you know? So like, again, try balancing all of that and um, 
the other thing that that I'm doing, and then I'll wrap this up because this feels a little long winded. Um, I decided to launch an, another platform called Radical Black Femme Project. Ashley, we should link. Um, and it's essentially it's a residency, uh, a global residency, and we're looking at hybrid experiences. Like how are we, how are we really thinking about our blackness um, inside of this digital space? Um, and so that is providing me a lot of um, a, a huge outlet to really be a lot more expressive, and again surround myself around people who are interested in really pushing forward a different narrative um and and simply being so yeah <laughs> that sounds beautiful and it's I, I really really i think we all sort of resonate with that high low thing you were saying and there's times with during this pandemic where it sort of felt like i'm like oh my god have i done anything and i'm thinking about this because of what you just said and it's like well but at, at the same time i feel like several of us are actually like pursuing new things right now for yeah. the first time or maybe like if you did you say you just started that the mfa now ashley did you say you just yeah so, you know, like it's weird. I feel there's like this, this like feeling very suppressed, but also this like kind of space of somehow persisting against it. And I'm really interested in that for, for myself as well. Like I, me and some friends, we started this, it's called the Unity Collective. It's like this platform basically to, that's meant to help activate people and realize that they are part of a community with that wherever they are. But really it's actually geared towards abolition. The first like sequence we did and getting people to think about abolition, what it, that even means. And um, and yeah, then like we it started from scratch with a couple of people who just felt like they need to do something. There's like this, I feel like there's a really strong feeling of need to like be somehow useful. And I think this might tie <laughs> to some of the questions that are already here, but like that idea of being useful in and out of your art, you know, and how being useful can sometimes be like something like a therapy or something that feels uh freeing or sometimes that constant need for that can also be like a weight um so how you guys been navigating that sort of like that sort of tension between making something being productive i guess um creatively or otherwise and also just sort of existing and serving yourself i mean I, yeah that i think that's just been a question i've been thinking about every i feel like every day i'm like and I put, even put that a similar question to you all, just to be like, so what are other people doing with the yo-yo and, <laughs> down and like, should I even be doing this? What am I doing? Um, and I honestly, I don't have an answer. I mean, on one hand, like um, similar to some things that y'all are saying, like, um, so uh, some of my friends and I was saying I was a drag king and we formed like a drag boy band, uh, I wanna say summer before this past summer. And we shot a music video in quarantine in which we were like all in our respective cities, shot this music video. And then we used the premiere to raise money for um, ballot uh, protection for this organization called Walk the Walk, um, which was just last week. And it was like, so it was really exciting. And we like from quarantine, we were like, we need to do something. We have to do something and like mm -hmm. use this like hilarious, like, you know, format of drag and music videos to somehow draw attention to something that's important. But it's it's interesting because I love doing that and like it was it was a really successful Zoom event. But then <laughs> at the same time, you know, I still, you know, every single thing I do isn't that. So I'm I don't know. I don't have an answer, but I, I feel like on one hand, I'm like, oh, I did something that felt like I actually like contributed in some way. And then I am again here in my studio, like trying to make paintings for some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's like I, I definitely resonate with that. Um, I honestly, though, I think that you know, I'm going to be a little corny and, and cliche, but I think we're, you know, the saying we're one and a part of the whole. And I think that um, individually contributing to yourself, um, I think, and, and yourself in terms of how you how you um, connect to the communities that you're in. But I think that that in itself is a job. <laughs> um, and I think that, again, learning how to balance that is super important. Um, important. I also think... Um, you know, we create and we do a lot of things that that we hope to kind of, some of us, 
I think we hope to kind of um, get out of this current reality that we're in. And I think people who are constantly, I think, focusing on um, providing, I don't want to say platforms, but providing like assistance to remind us of where we are. I And I don't know if any of that makes sense, but instead of trying to escape it, <laughs> um, I think that that is something that is helpful, but I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer, an answer to that because I'm also, you know, in trying to figure out how I can find a damn studio space outside of my living room to make dances because that's, you know, contributing to my survival and hopefully a larger conversation, right? Because I, I mean, I just, I think that that's the duty of art, right? That's our responsibility um, uh, that we have been given. Um, certain gifts. Um, and so, yeah, that's a hard, that's a hard question to answer. Yeah, it, it's hard. And I, it's like sort of like a question that sort of like lives and moves through you over time. I, yep. and even outside of the super high stakes moment or of right now. Um, and I've been sort of trying to get better. It's, it's crazy how much I've been stressed out about like uh, like writing my novel, for example. And I'm thinking, but like, you know, like this is a unprecedented time on like a global scale, but then also then my mom was sick. My mom had COVID and uh, she had since recovered, but she was like actually sick, like hospitalized and everything. And um, realizing, seeing that and feeling that and knowing that I'm still worried about these other sort of like this like sort of I, this thing that's hardwired into my, my system even though I'm always like railing against capitalism but this feeling of like you are like knowing you are you're valuable and you deserve good outside of your productivity or anything you ever produce but still feeling like but really though in my heart like I should be doing this that, and the other but um I'm trying to get better at um remembering that like you know serving yourself is, is is a way of serving the whole in some way you know especially if you know that the person you are often is concerned with contributing in other, in other ways so it is a, I don't know if there is any easy answer but just something I've been thinking of especially after what you said yeah even just hearing y'all talk and reflecting on this question um I'm just like it's just I feel like a wave that will go up and down and that we will just be riding yeah. Just like bobbing yeah. them off. Yeah. No, yeah, for sure. For sure. It's just, yeah. It's 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 magnified right now. <laughs> it is for sure. And and there's so many I try to like find different ways of thinking about it. Um I, I was doing this other panel, it was, it was a short film thing. I was help I was just moderating it. And one of the panelists was saying exactly like, you know, I, I can't imagine I seen someone a who's also a rapper to buy my CD during this time or whatever, da, 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 or even look at my music. And when the other panelists was like, you know, I really think of my work as active generosity. And I really think, mm -hmm. that, and, and I think that framing was sort of unlocking, unlock something for a lot of people, even myself sometimes, uh, you know, you, you're doing this thing for a reason. And in some ways, you know, remembering it's a generous act to produce, to put yourself, you know, it's not a no cost. Right. Um, um, to, and so, um, Remembering that as well, I think sometimes helps me navigate. Yeah, I was saying um, all value is in monetary. Like, you know, there's, right. and I know that you all probably hear this a lot, you know, the emotional and physical labor. And I think it's specifically attached to black bodies. And I, I think that many of us and many of the conversations that I've been having have been centered around that and really thinking about what does it mean to decolonize our ways of thinking being that we've all been indoctrinated into the same system. I also say, you know, I was saying all white supremacists aren't white. Like that's something that specific, specifically right now is super um, present. Um, and, and especially on social media, seeing how people are responding, responding to different things. I'm like, yo, like what world are we in? Like, <laughs> So, yeah, and, and of course that comes up as an artist, like if you're making socially relevant work, you know, so, yeah, well, you know, I guess that kind of leads to another question, um, which, 
I'm curious to know, has your work changed? Are you still trying to stay in the stay in creating work the way that you've done it pre COVID or has it, has it transformed and manifested itself in, in different ways? Like, are you including your photography or do you plan to not include your photography in any of, in any of your novels or? Yeah. You know? That's such a good question. And maybe some, it's the second time someone asked me that today. So like, it's a sign, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, Heed the omens. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, with my photography, I still consider myself sort of like a novice. Uh, so like, I think maybe down the line and I do, I, but whether it's um, what I've, something I've discovered recently, whether it's writing, um, music or visuals, you know, I think storytelling is really the idea, the medium that I've sort of had the most, like have put my 10,000 hours in is like linear stories via text or writing, you know, that's what I have sort of the facility in. I love it as well. But um, I, I think more and more I'm getting interested in these other spaces. But the things that I think have changed are prior to this sort of last, I mean, so much has changed, so much has happened in the last two years, even before COVID for me, like the book came out, right? We, the travels have happened. I, so even the way I thought of myself as an artist shifted. Um, and knowing that there's an audience that I, I try to not let it affect my sort of process but i'm sure it has in ways i'm not even mm -hmm. exactly cognizant of yet but um i remember feeling like oh every i was very precious about all my work and i still am but i remember being like you know a story has to be bad for months and then i gotta like rewrite it a zillion times and i gotta wait sometimes i wait eight months before i even look at it again after i get a draft and da -da 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 -da. but then the opportunity came up to write a story sort of reflecting on right now and as a challenge to myself i did it and then i have some friends who are interested in writing and i I used the opportunity to make it like an exercise in vulnerability. And I was like, you know, for me, this was very vulnerable to, I showed a draft to everyone. Like, I'm going to make this a story. I'm going to submit it to this thing in like three weeks, which is very different than anything from the way I've ever done a story like being released. And I, I just needed to do it because I was getting to this box of, I was starting to like sub in. It, it seemed like it was like extra preparedness and thoroughness, but it was really like sort of a fear thing. I was letting fear sort of, and I think that because fear was so everywhere in the air, I wanted to actively resist that. And so I've tried to, I don't know if my connection is breaking, but I tried to, um, I tried to do that. So writing a story and a much faster turnaround than normal was one thing that I did that was different. And then um, being a little bit more unafraid to directly, and, and like I was already working on a novel, so just d diving hardcore into the novel and it ha I started the novel like seven years ago, but just so happens to be very, very like much about sort of the systems that we're sort of interrogating extra hard right now, like prisons and carceral rates. And um, it made me feel like, you know what? Don't be afraid, go for it. And so in some ways, oh, I, yeah. that's been a change. I don't know, but I feel it's almost like in writing, I was trying to convince myself and the world kind of was like, no, no, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And so that has helped, even though it makes me feel afraid sometimes. It's like, it feels like the burden got bigger, but you know, I don't know if that really answers the question, but that's kind of some ways I think it's like sort of change if that's a change. No, that's a huge change. I think we all, listen, fear is a mother no. insert. Yeah. For real, it can, it can really prevent you apart. It can prevent you from doing a lot of stuff. And I think that, you know, we're, we're not dealing necessarily with just like what's around us. We're also dealing with what's been born into us. So it's, it's, it's a lot. That's a lot of like deconstructing, mm -hmm. tearing down that's happening. But I'm sorry, I jumped on yes, um, your words, Ashley, you're about to talk. Oh, oh, I was just, I was just like really the word fear actually on my notes where I'm like writing down some things y'all are saying. I wrote, just make the painting like last night. <laughs> Oh, and I was like, girl, yeah. I need to do <laughs> think about. And I think like yeah. I came, I came to school for the purpose of doing just that, like changing it up, trying new things, like you know, researching and experimenting. But you know, the context changed obviously 360 to 480 degrees beyond. <laughs> like, and so I like made nothing. I mean, I made nothing until I got here. Like, I think I made one collage while I was in quarantine. Like, I was just like, I was like, 
you know, like playing them some music. I'm a DJ. So I was like maybe doing some DJ stuff, but like, I was just like, I'm just going to do nothing. Cause honestly, I don't even know where to start right now. And so I think since I've been here, I've been really trying to reconnect with the, with my imagination. And I think that there is a little bit of fear in that because it is to, to do that or to find that space is stepping into the unknown or like unresolved or like not sure how it's going to go. Um, but I think just kind of, even just, you know, talking to y'all right now, I'm like, and I wrote Just Make the Painting yesterday. So I'm just like, if anything, <laughs> needs to be doubled down on in the next 48 hours is imagination <laughs> and experimentation and um, at least within the walls of this space where I have control in this room, my studio, um, is really trying to like, be like, okay, for this hour, like I'm not gonna second guess or try to create a narrative around something before it even exists. Yes, I love yeah. that. I love yeah. That. No, like, you know, from the moment that we're born, we're taught to lie to ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think that like what what makes artists so dope is that we tap into something, you know, we tap into what's innately a part of us, like that, our imagination, our ability to create, our ability to be alchemists, like turning dirt into gold, like that's what we're dope at. The thing that I think, you know, it's always hard, like, how do you balance that? Like you're at Yale <laughs> where they're teaching you all these different processes and ways of like, how do you look at art? What does this mean? You know, and I'm just making assumptions. I didn't go to Yale, so I don't know exactly what you're experiencing in your program. But, you know, having gone to school there, there, sometimes those things work against you. So it's like how do, learning how to like take the tools that help you right and help you um um really expand and manifest different ways of, of of conjuring and creating your own particular art and then you know like i think that that's 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 just such a difficult thing to do and i don't think we ever we ever step back and and have the opportunity unfortunately covid provided many of us that opportunity right like there's like a catch-22 with it i have family members who contracted the virus as well um people who didn't make it some people who didn't who didn't make it as well and I think um the blessing in that is that I was forced to personally slow down like I was on tour um all right. and all of my tour dates have been canceled until 2022 and I was like uh I gotta I still gotta bring home a bag I still gotta make some money so <laughs> I still I have to figure that out but I also had to figure out how to do it in a way that I don't feel used anymore. Mm -hmm. I have to do it in a way that I feel like I'm I'm in I, that I'm in control. Honestly, like, um, and I know that that's also like some give and take and figuring out how to do that as well. But um, yeah, fear fear is um, definitely one of those things I think we all deal with. I think we all deal with like you know that's directly. Um, connected to imposter syndrome. I've been having a lot of conversations with, with, with people and artists about that. Like, you know, when, um, I, when George Floyd was murdered, right? All of a sudden there was like a, a ridiculous amount of white dollars being thrown at everything. And, and people are like, well, where the is all this money coming from all of a sudden right. like oh so this actually existed and you all had the capacity to support people in one way or another but now all of a sudden you can hmm um but so like that happening too i think really really forced a lot of people in myself specifically to step back and say okay like how how am i going to be moving forward um and 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 will it be in this this arena like you know but i i feel like i got it i had the choice mm -hmm. i got to make the decision and so as debilitating as this moment may be it's also um i think can be one of empowerment for a lot of people too absolutely and it's making me think of ways in like the literary space where it's been a hundred percent true in like this non-theoretical way real like the short version is uh, of a story that happened a couple months ago. There was a hashtag called Publishing Paid Me. 
And long story short, it was revealed that surprise, surprise, white authors are get white authors are getting paid exponentially more than black authors. And these are and like even people like the example that was famous, uh, this guy. I can't, this, whatever his name is, debut author. He's not like an independently famous person, just a regular guy. I got like $800,000 for his debut. And Jasmine Ward, who had won the National Book Award already. She won it <laughs> the one time. And she talked about how she had to struggle and beg for them to, I think, to go to 100, 100,000 for the, for the book. After the, she came with a higher prize. She won it. And then the next, the next book, the very next. And even if it would have been trying to struggle to get 200, it still would have been, but just like, that's how, N.K. Jemison, who's beyond a legend, won the Hugo Award more than anybody else. When they when they show what she's gotten for some of the trilogies, it's like, oh my God. But anyways, by participating in that and talking about it, like my contract, we ended up restructuring it directly because I I I, I wanted, and I don't have a net poor relationship with my um, editors or any of the publishers. But it was like this is just the truth, and I put it out there to be in solidarity. I, I didn't want to like not be in solidarity with everyone because it, it was people, it was black authors and and white authors like saying this is what their contract was because there, there's sort of this um there was sort of this uh you know lack of transparency which these corporate entities sort of depend on for these sort of unfair practices that they do or even maybe to be fair to them even they don't maybe they don't even know but no they know but anyways um so like that this time period it's been really it's it's put into fo it's put a lot a lot of pressure has been put because when the public cares about something these companies have to respond or they can they or they they can they, they should if they're going to be what we That's wanna, a better answer. <laughs> They, they, they should. They should if they, and also like we can kind of force them a little bit if sometimes you know, um, or the part, active participants. So in that case, it was the authors who like really put a lot of pressure, and hopefully will change the thing, change the shape of uh, that sort of la landscape. And the you know the WNBA for a long time has sort of pushed in that space, in that field, much, much more harder than the NBA has. But now the NBA sort of started to like, sort of like push in that same way, in the same regard. And they changed the things that I couldn't have imagined happen, happening two years ago were happening a lot. So um, yeah, these companies, the, this, the, it, there's so much to, to keep track of and there's so much to be aware of in, in this time. And, um, you know, but there is like a lot of real pressure that hopefully is going to manifest into to, into something. Um, since George Floyd, but any, even in the mod, and but there's also a price within the other side. So when you said the thing about George Floyd, I, I remember earlier this year I was like getting something all these interviews, and I was like, "What's going on?" And I was like, "Like why now?" And I, then I realized because Ahmaud Aubrey had been murdered, and because the first the first story in my book deals very directly with. Um, uh, the extrajudicial killing of black people. Um, I've realized that I've sort of become like a black death correspondent in, for some people's mm -hmm. minds. And the book had come out in Germany at that time. And so like, I, I spoke, to, I, there was a week I spoke to like German people like four times wow. about what was going on here. And I'm still sort of navigate how I feel about that. Cause it's like sort of having to like be thrust into this sort of dark sort of harsh space on terms that are not your own. And um, but at the same time, I also want to be like, well, I have this opportunity, this platform, let me say what I think needs to be said, how I think it needs to be said, and not like sort of shy away from it. And that's been sort of the scary kind of space to navigate as well. Yeah, I'm a black death correspondent. It's really, right. it's, it's a thing. It's rough. But yeah, and that's 100% why it is. Like, they'll tell you too, like, they'll like, it'll, it'll be like an email. I mean, the thing that's like crazy to me about all of that when it comes to just death of a human being, like I don't under, I have a hard time and I'm going to digress a little bit. I think maybe as black people, like we, we've kind of mm, through media, through like just socializing, we've been taught to empathize with everybody. And so if someone or something is murdered, I think innately we understand that, we feel that. Yeah. Um, I have a hard time understanding why other people don't feel and yeah. see that when our bodies fall. That yeah. I, I, um, it, oh, it just, it, I. <laughs> it's yeah. brutal. It's brutal. and. I think about it often 
because in, in, in fiction spaces, whether it be writing or like movies or whatever, part of it, at least, a, at least a small part of it is, I think if you're not white, you've been trained from, if you t t intake any type of popular media, any media at all, to look at a person who doesn't look like you as potentially very good, having a lot of depth, being very human, the spectrum mm -hmm. of human, good, bad, or whatever. We've seen them be heroes. We've seen them be villains. We've seen them be good, but uh, it's there are some people because of the racism that is inherent to all, so many of these popular spaces, popular media spaces, that they are not used to seeing people that don't look like them literally just be human, just be someone that you care about. And if you're black, you're forced to be trained to do that. You know, from whether you talk about, I don't even know, Tommy from the Power Rangers or whoever, like from the beginning, <laughs> you're going to be like invested yeah. in someone that doesn't look like you as like the leader, the best, the cool one, the strong one, the nice one, the mean one, whatever it is. And to me, that's it's just to me, that's just one side of why representation is so important. But mm -hmm. it's it's one that I do. I can like see. Yeah. The issue though is like, you know, it's not just people who look like us or who don't look like us who who suffer from that. It's people who look like us too, you know? Like the amount of shit that we have to break down within ourselves um, just to take a step forward is incredible. So mm. yeah, like I even even being asked to do this call, um, Earlier this year, I got I got asked to do a couple of different things, um, and I said no to most all of them except for this one. <laughs> um, and I just have a different kind of respect for the people who run this program, so that was um, super helpful. But I just I I didn't feel like being a part of any conversation uh, or being propped up to be a part of any kind of conversation to talk about these issues that are like so apparent, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, they have taken centuries to build <laughs> and it will take centuries to deconstruct me stepping on a call. And, and this is how I felt back then, but me hopping on a call and, and, and having these conversations where, you know, specific people could just go pick up a damn book. I was just like over it. Um, that's not necessarily in my sentiment right now, a little bit, a little bit, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, um, like you said, Nana, like we have these platforms, there are people, um, specifically young people who are, who are, you know, following, if you will, in our footsteps. And I think that, you know, if anything, um, being, being some, some type of representation for them, hopefully, <laughs> will contribute to transforming this crazy system that we're kind of rat holing in. But anyway. The youth, the youth. What's yeah. that? I just was saying the youth. I mean, that's yeah. I, where I came to, to this school. I was um, doing, running, like uh, uh, helping run a mentorship program for young artists. And I'm just like, that's, I'm like, yeah, that's the type of thing where I'm like, that's what I'm, you know, working towards getting back into where the, there's a similar program here in the um, But yeah, just like channeling my anxiety <laughs> into telling other people like what what's possible or like just, yeah, propping them yeah. up. And like propping other people up and shouting them out. And yeah, because I, I feel like similarly, like I'm very skeptical of people like trying to get me to do things <laughs> such as talk publicly. I'm like, yeah. That, while y'all were talking, I was like, right now it's like crazy time where it's like, okay, we're literally dying. And then also people are like, want to buy your art in all types of ways, every type. And and also like all of these like throw black, throwback black TV shows are on Netflix. <laughs> and I'm just kind of like, what is going on here? Um, yeah. So it's, it's wild. It's very wild, but also I kind of lost what I was saying, but yeah. It's okay. We didn't lose it. We were following. No, but like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, but like, like that, that's so real. Being invited and um, my experience at, at Albany was just, was, uh, was really lovely. Like I went in person and did some workshops and stuff. So I was like, okay, if you guys are asking, then. 
<laughs> yeah, Albany is really interesting. I know, Nana, you said you're an alum. And I, you know, there were some there were some issues, not at the university, but just in the town um, with, they're not as open, right? And I guess to be expected, right? Versus, you know, being at a university versus the, 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 the actual location of the university. I'm just curious, like, what was your experience like? Do you feel like you, um, I don't know, walked away with what you needed? Uh, Cause that's a, that's a PWI, not, <laughs> not necessarily a place that yeah. focuses on. Yeah, yeah I was very lucky. Um, so at the time I went to Albany and still, it, it was different for me where I'm, I'm from a place called Spring Valley Rockin County, which is just over the bridge from the city. And in my graduating class, we had like maybe five white people in it. I was around minorities for most of, and I was in Queens before I got to Rockin County. So I've been around mostly minorities for most of my life. And I went to college. It was the first time I was like, oh, like, you know, this is like where you feel that minority thing. But that said, the black community at the time was super, super strong. And we were, me and my friends were like very tapped in we uh we <laughs> like we threw the um my senior year at the homecoming party it ended up being like a crazy debacle which doesn't have to be discussed now but um <laughs> it was we i felt very we had a group you know what i mean like we had a fam i had it like that i'm still cool with to this day like very cool with um someone that went to it's my high school who went to college with me i just i was just seeing his guy his, he's my his son is my godson and so we got lucky like we had a huge a big strong uh and connected black community um and i that's just what i was in like i couldn't tell you what was going on in like the white side of the, <laughs> the whole thing you know um but we were good so we were pretty locked in and i mean on a, obviously there's like weirdness that happens on like the ad it sucks that like, i said obviously like it, there's no chances i can be weird or racist stuff going on at the administrative level but a, it's like almost like hard to um, parse it, but because of Albany's proximity to the city, and the pro and the the biggest programs being mostly people from the city, like they kind of have to like act pretty cool, mm -hmm. and like you know, when you, and there's ways you can tell, right? Like we have the big concerts or whatever, and you can see what type of artists they pick, and it'll be like our kind of people, you know. I seen J. Cole there, I seen Fab there, I seen French Mont. Like, you know, like it was like Yeah, Ty Liv was there. I was like, what? No, <laughs> we no, we we got to control that stuff, you know? So Yeah, that's dope. Um, so I got we got pretty lucky with that in that in that regard. Like obviously, certainly it's not Howard, but um we got <laughs> while I was there, I felt uh like we had that community space and the resources to like make it the space we would like it to be. So we, we got pretty lucky there. Ashley, you say your grandmother started the basketball program at Delaware University. Did you go there? Or did um, you go to school? I went to Boston University. Boston, in, okay. In, in Boston. But yeah, she started um, Dillard's women's basketball team in 1973 after the NCAA passed uh, the, or not NCAA, when the government passed um, Title IX, saying everyone had to have equal Mm. in publicly funded institutions um and so yeah i was i was just like making collages with WNBA basketball cards just kind of like creating these like exploding kind of like basketball players and then i like forgot remembered that my grandmother was a basketball coach like when i was like in kindergarten like i would go to the games and like they would be doing the tootsie roll like i'd be eating popcorn and i just like forgot oh. that completely and then i remembered it because i saw a photo album and then i paint a lot on top of on our top, top of archival images and i'm trying to get into painting with some photos i've taken myself but, so then i started like using the archival photos of her um coaching team and merging the worlds of the two which that's was awesome that makes me want to hear more about just how you guys sort of came to your sort of forms generally uh mm -hmm. how you sort of because because collage that's that seems particularly unique that that's like a sort of specific kind of mixing of things and and i i'm not sure what type of dance but like like to like sort of live your art is like another type of you know is that's another thing too so i'm interested in how did you guys sort of come to your your form 
I don't know. I know I'm gonna. I hopefully I'm gonna pull you out of my pocket whenever uh, somewhere, in Nana, because the way that you're you're just very descriptive, as expected, right? You're a writer, but um, <laughs> live your art. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm really. <laughs> <laughs> send me notes. Send me notes, Ashley. He's over here dropping all the bombs. No. Uh, <laughs> but literally though you know what i'm saying like literally yeah though. yeah no yeah. it's real though it's real I, I think that's why we're both trying to take the notes because it, it's it's really resonating i got friends who are dancers that's why ah so you get it <laughs> um let's see so i grew up in the south my family's from well, i was born in lubbock texas my family grew up picking cotton it's like a real thing so oh. um and my family is still in between texas and florida um but I also grew up as a very silent kid. And I always, I have to tell this story because um, it's it's just directly connected to why movement is my first medium and my first language. Um, but I don't think I really learned how to speak until um, I, and when I say learn like agency, feeling like I said something and it mattered or actually speaking up about things until I probably was like 11 or 12. Um, and. And that was around the time that I had my first dance class. Um, and I started out doing all of the classical art forms. So um, specifically ba ballet and modern, um, which I think was probably the worst thing ever as a, a, bl a young black girl. Um, I, I just, I wish that I had started out doing something a lot more connected to, to the ground <laughs> and to my roots, but here we are. Um, the work that I do, it's, it's a mixture of everything that I've ever done. And honestly, like I'm really thinking about again, and I think we started this conversation around like decolonizing minds and bodies. Um, and so I specifically am focused on that, um, and really figuring out like, what does movement mean to me? And what does that look like inside of inside of my body and the world that I create for this particular thing to exist. Um, but yeah, I dance is, is my first medium, but I'm inspired by literally everything. Um, so yeah, I hope that, I think that answers your question. Yeah, for yeah. sure. What about you? Um, yeah, I write uh, and like I used to say this as like a joke before, but like, it's more true now that I see how expensive all these other things are, these cameras and whatnot are like, I liked writing cause it was like free and no one could take it from me. Um, mm. I think I got, so I mean like, you know, a lot of people have that kind of escapist kind of like some type of young youth trauma or something might push them towards something. I think like our, my parents or like my family's like situation with like sort of Oh, our circumstances suddenly changed and now it's like a housing instability thing and like seeing lights off and that whole thing made me feel like wow like they'll really take anything from you you know if they can yeah. and um i remember feeling like writing becoming like a sort of haven to me in that that time period that was like i really 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 needed something um and like even if it was like you know with a cell phone light and like a pen I can use one of my dad's legal pads and like make something and be somewhere else. And, and it be, it's become, there's, it's become more layered and there's something beyond that now, but like, there is really just a, this is something that makes me feel something. And it's, and I, and I know that I, I know that I made it and it can't be taken. And that still matters to me a lot, but mm -hmm. the barrier to entry, I mean, that's changing with how free I, I go on YouTube so much to learn about whatever. <laughs> and I just didn't exist back then. And some of that knowledge would have cost how much before. And to even get a camera, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's a lot. Or so many of the other forms, it just, but I just liked having in the library as well as free. So um, there's something else besides that. I mean, like my older sister was really into reading and so reading was cool in my house, but that's probably just, that is just as important. But um, I think me finding something that I could do on my own and was like just mine and mine alone and could never really be stolen or taken um, was a big part of it for me. I feel like it's, it's interesting. We all kind of have these art forms that are so accessible to yourself. <laughs> I mean, uh, Jane, you're literally using yourself. Yeah. Um, and I definitely was like a drawer 
as a kid. I was like drawing. I would. I was telling somebody the other day. I was like drawing pizzas. Like I remember, like I was in first grade and I would like draw pizzas and hand them out to people. Like I love to draw. Like basically, you know the McDonald's play place with the tubes and like. Yeah. Oh yeah. I would just draw those. Like I would just fill a whole page with just like an imagined play place, and make comic books and all this kind of stuff. And so I think it's it's it, it, it's very helpful actually in this moment to be reminded of like the immediacy of, of the form. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, something that- good about that, about being able to just have it. There's something, there's something powerful in that. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that, you know, getting, I think I said this earlier about like not letting your training overtake everything that you do, you know, like there's something super important about, I think for me, it's, it's, it's being able to improv. I think maybe for you all, it has something along the lines with being free free writing. Right. Um, but like, I, um, yeah, I don't think I've ever had this much time to do it. So that's also kind of painful. (laughs) You know, like there's like this, I like process and I, and, and I've had to kind of run away from that right now. Like, sure, it's helpful, but kind of similar to what Nana was saying earlier about like, you wrote this story and you shared it in three weeks, as opposed to how you normally go through that sharing process. So yeah, I think there's just, you know, we're breaking a lot of barriers. Go team. (laughs) 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 